So welcome to the Discovery Podcast at ARU and today we're talking to Mark Pickering who is the Technical Officer and Studio Manager for Audio and Music Technology. Hello. Hi Mark. Hello. And we've also got Laura Reed, who's a second year student on the Audio and Music Technology course. Hi Laura. Hi. You can speak, it's all right. <laughs> and I'm Simon Gogli, I'm a senior lecturer on the course as well. So um, we just wanted to along with looking at some footage of the studios sure. a bit later on, um, wanted to ask Mark about what his job's all about. So um, what do you do in the studios and what's your kind of responsibility for? Well, I look after and maintain f six recording studios, if we include this one as well. Yeah. Uh, so we have five audio recording studios, one podcast studio, and I also look after a room which contains 20... Mac Minis, um, yeah. Our lab. Our lab, our AV lab, as, as, as we call it. Yeah, so my on a day-to-day, -day, I'm doing little things like handing, handing out microphones, giving advice on what might be a good choice of mic, perhaps, because I've been doing it quite a while. I'll be assisting people like Laura here um, in the studio um, a lot. Um, and yeah, just... Being there as a technical assistant sort and day to day running, making sure everything's yeah. wor working, yeah. and making sure people know what they're doing. Exactly. Assuming. And there's a certain amount of training involved in that, isn't there, for the students? Absolutely. Because look, it, it's, you know, it's not the, the simplest of systems that we have. And we have, so we have five recording studios. They're all set up very differently, um, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, I was going to ask you what's the, what's the philosophy behind having them all being so different from well, each other? So the, the idea behind that is is um, this was that this was discussed as a as a as a as a course as well that some courses in, that I've seen in some studios that have multiple rooms have pretty much the same setup in every room which is cool and it's easy and it makes things easy to to look after but from a student's perspective they're not getting a, a broad I would say education um, and I think it's really important to to have and experience different workflows within recording studios, so it might be purely digital, which is probably the easiest. Um, if it's just like, say, like a Dante card or something, Mike's going into it, that's that. Um, or you could have, say, an analog mixer, which interfaces digitally with a computer or an uh, integrated workstation, as I like to call them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you've got lots of different mixing desks, different ways of doing things, and I, th and I think the philosophy is that the, the more experience they have, the more ready they'll be to, to go into any studio or any live environment and just use the equipment there because they've had you know a, a broad experience. Yeah, it's about teaching flexibility. Flexibility, and, you know, indeed. Ability to cope with different situations is rather than just being used to doing one thing one way. Yeah. What, what do you think about that, Laura? Um, I like it. I Because I prefer analog gear in general because of the tactile nature of it. So ha having the choice to be in a uh, studio too where you physically plug the outboard gear in to the thing on the rack into the... The patch mix. bay. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I much prefer that. So if we had lots of the same studio and it was all done digitally like Studio 3, I wouldn't... Pref I would like that less. So it's good right. to have the option yeah. and find what you prefer yourself because as a student you have no idea what you're going to prefer until you've tried the different things and that kind of relates to uh the student's future employability doesn't it like in you know what in, in what in your experience what's the sort of the, the thinking you took behind how these different setups can help them get different lines of work basically well absolutely yeah um well like we say you know it, it's it me I, I, what i think is is that if you can if you can work through studios one to five and you can suss them all out, you can go into any situation and be able to use the equipment. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, live shows and that kind of thing tend to, are moving more towards digital consoles like Yamaha CL5s and that kind of thing. Um, so that's why we've got the, the DM1000 that everybody 
fears. <laughs> it's a 48 channel. In fact, well, I'll go through the studio. So let's, let's start with Studio One, shall we? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Studio One, you've got a 12 channel uh, TL Audio tube tracker, right? Now that's a derivative, uh, um, shall we say, what's the word? Uh, product from TL were basically known as, as a preamp desk, weren't they? they you, you'd, you'd use it as a yeah. preamp desk, but someone put a, a digital interface into it, and then suddenly you've got 12 uh, easy to use channels of, of valve. Um, so that's a 12 channel analog valve mixer with a firewire interface built into it. Um, and that's really just to get people started, but it's also it's also a decent you know place to record vocals and that kind of thing because it does mm. have a really nice warm sound. But it's very simple, so that gets people s- set off. And in Studio Two, we have the Toft ATB um, sixteen, so sixteen analog inputs. Um, there's a little bit more there. There's a bit. There's there's some really nice built-in EQ, which. Are they, they're this, it's Malcolm Toff who designed it. And what was the, what was it's, the other? Um, it's based on the original Trident. Trident. I, I yeah. always forget the name of that. Yeah. Yeah, based on the original Trident. And that's that. That's that Which, kind of you know, was a big analog name for consoles in the 70s. Yeah. You know, they had them at, you know, used for David Bowie albums and all that kind of stuff. So they've, they've got a good heritage. Yeah. And it's absolutely. kind of classic, an, classic sounding analog desk, yeah. basically. Yeah. And then with that, we've got a bit of outboard equipment as well and a patch bay, as Laura was talking about. That's just giving given students a bit more options there as well, as well as 16 channels of nice EQ, um, auxiliary sends, groups. And the desk is in line, isn't it? So yes. you, you actually have 32 inputs yes. if, if you need them. Yes, absolutely. And then Studio 3, which is the one that people fear quite a lot, <laughs> the SSL Matrix, which is actually a great, versatile studio um, different there because the preamps are all outboard because it's basically it's a line mixer and it's it's really more of a control surface, um, so that's reliant on the outboard um, preamps which we have eight SSL preamps with the variable harmonic distortion which is very um, nice thing to have. Studio four is the DM one thousand which is the one people fear the most because it's the most complicated. Desk uh, totally digital and and menu driven and yep. so on, but quite difficult to use. But once you've got on top of it, you could probably use any digital desk, and that they're mainly yep. what are used in the live arena. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you get yourself head head around one of those, and then you go into the live arena and you've got a QL one or a CL five Yamaha sort of industry standard, you'll be able to work it out pretty quickly. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. And then of course Studio Five B, we'll go to next, which is twenty four channels. Um, again, that's one of these built-in interface mixing desks, so that makes it a bit easier to set up. Um, but again, we get it's twenty-four channels. It's got a, l- a little bit less than Studio Five A has in terms of outboard and mixing capability, but it was a great room to track in. And Studio Five A, so five is split into three rooms: Five A, Five Live Room, and Five B. Um, and it's that's a really good thing to have because we we can have. Um, two groups working in the air at the same time we can have somebody mixing, we can have a whole group recording or we can have a class going, working at both ends um, and it's quite quite versatile 5A is the Audient um, ASP ASP, ASP Audient in there uh, uh, AT24 or something so that's an analogue mixing desk with a control surface in the middle of it as well so you can do a bit of um, software control but 24 analogue inputs um, again, uh, in, again, in line, in line. So it's actually forty-eight, forty-eight, indeed. Inputs with uh, a full patch bay and yep. full patch bay. Yep, and some lovely outboard gear in there, which and is um, yeah. really quite proud of all that equipment that we've got in there. Warm audio. We've got Toft. We've got uh, UAD. UAD. Um, and we've also got some it's, solid uh, state stuff as well. Yeah, and the Lexicon reverbs and yep. TC stuff, I think, as well, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, a, a, a veritable smorgasbord of... Uh, and what about um, you know, quite a lot of people uh, who come and look around on open days ask about software and stuff, and we yep. s- speak to them about what they use, because very people are very computer-based. Absolutely. Days. So what, what's our kind of take on what software we have? Now, with software-wise, we can't please everybody, so we go with what's industry standard. Well, Pro Tools is industry standard, 
and logic is industry standard. And for recording and mixing, that's pretty much all all we need. Um, within the AV lab, we have a whole another array of different software. Um, Ableton Live is available in the music department as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of more where for we're the, at. The sort of more electronic, electronic. music-minded, yep. uh, live performance kind of stuff. Ableton is yep. is there, but as far as the studio end of things is concerned, certainly in my experience, that whenever you go to a commercial studio or uh, film dubbing place or whatever, generally speaking, it's Pro Tools. Yeah, but a lot of producers use Logic as yep. well. So yeah, and it, it's I think I think they both have their advantage. I think Logic has more more um virtual instruments and plugins and that just in just in with it so that's you can so it's quite good for let's say if you want to do some sound design straight off the bat you've got all these available sounds the um midi's quite um intuitive to absolutely yeah slot in without what's your preferred software laura um i prefer pro tools because i'm not really an apple person so the way that logic works Oh, I see. It's a less Afraid intuitive of the Apple. to me. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Pro Tools has the advantage that it can be used on PC as well. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I mean, quite a few uh, new students come in and they, they've only been using uh, PC-based software. Yep. And generally speaking, they haven't got into Pro Tools because it's a bit more pro level than what they're used to. So, I mean, we don't, we, we don't, and it's more expensive, and we don't say to people, oh, you can't use the DAW that you like. You can carry on using whatever you like, but it's we feel that it's really important that um, people know how to use the industry standard. Yeah, absolutely. Because that that is like a big key thing yeah. for employability. Because that's the same in the film world as well, um, which we didn't touch on. Because my other, I, I'm a filmmaker I was as gonna, well. Yeah, I'll ask worry. you all about that. Um, so the industry standard is obviously right now. It's Adobe Creative Cloud. That is where. It's all going, and it's becoming better and better every time they do they, they release a, a, an update. Um, Final Cut, obviously, and Avid um, as well. They're the, they're the real ones for that. And what's cool is we have a site-wide license for Adobe Creative Cloud as well, so anyone can use it, all of it, which is great. So thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you.